I'm very excited about this um, this conversation because I think it's going to be very interesting. As you know, the number of biennials has absolutely mushroomed in the world in the last few two decades, I should say. And we're very lucky here to have both curators and artists. So how about that? You're getting two for one, in a sense, in this talk. So I'd like to start immediately to my left with Gabi. Gabi Kobo. Is that near enough? <laughs> I can't really pronounce her name. Uh, she co-curated the 32nd Biennale de San Paolo in 2016. Um, and uh, in Cape Town, she's worked on the Isaco South African National Gallery and at the Cape Africa Platform, where she cura co-curated the Cape 07 Biennale in 2007. She teaches at the Witt School of Arts in South Africa, and she has moved already to Berlin for the Biennale, which remind me of the dates? June 2018, and lasts for how long? Uh, Till September. Till September, so the summer. And then further to my left, not very far away, all the same, I don't think they need any introduction, Elm Green Dagset, who are curating the Istanbul Biennale, which is closer. I mean, they are, as I say, they need really no introduction. They've worked together since 1995. They live in Berlin. Um, probably they're best known for their Prada Marfa and the Nordic Pavilion, particularly the death of the collector at 2009 Biennale, which I'm sure we will all, uh, we all remember and loved. And also, of course, the fourth plinth in London, where I come from. So we're going to start with uh, a presentation of, of what your plans are for the Biennale and then Elm Green drags it. And then after that, we'll engage in a conversation. And there will be a, a little time at the end, about 10, 15, 10 minutes at the end for you to ask questions. So if you think of questions, keep them for the end. So Gabby, over to you. Hello. Um, hi, good afternoon. Um, but as, as it has been mentioned, uh, the Berlin Biennale, the 10th Berlin Biennale opens in June, so in a year's time. Um, I feel like I cannot divulge um, um, too much, um, mainly because also I don't have much to divulge and many things can change. I think it's, it's different with you. But what, <laughs> but what is uh, out there in the public that is uh, known is that the curatorial team or the people that I will be working with have been announced. Um, and um, my practice, whether working in, in pseudo institutions or collaborating with people, is very collaborative, or teaching rather, is very collaborative. So I would not have wanted to, um, to do this um, speaking to myself or... or, or um, but there are people that I have been in conversation with over uh, a couple of years. Um, conversations that, you know, are unending and, and, and I wanted to bring those conversations into, into this project. And so these people are people who I think um, there's, there's a lot of things that are happening in, in, in, in Berlin at, at this time. So the idea is to of course, not ignore, um, but to to be able to acknowledge that things are in process, conversations are in process. But also what I bring is these conversations that have been in process in my previous project uh, with me to, to, to the Berlin Biennale. And your four curators? Four, you have four co-curators or four curators who come from where? Um, Noma Tuma Masilela comes from New York. Um, Moses Serubiri comes from Uganda in Kampala. Uh, Yvette Mutumba comes from Berlin. And um, Tiago de Paula Souza comes from Sao Paulo in, in Brazil. And the title, it has got a title, post-colonial? No, no, not at all. It's, it's, it's, uh, the title is not there yet. Right. Um, and it's not post-colonial. It's not. <laughs> and <laughs> do you have a theme? Um, or is this part of the I, conversations you're having now? Uh -huh. Well, I mean, the idea is not really to have a theme, but to, to, to, to, to, to have a position. And, um, and I think with the conversations that I, I have with these collaborators, 
and many other people that may not be visible, is to really um, acknowledge all the things that are happening and find our position within that rather than a theme per se. So that has not, is not, I have a, a working kind of title, but which is, which might change. And I won't really say what it was or it is. Thank you so much. So let's move on now to Istanbul, where we do have a title, which is A Good Neighbor. Can you tell us more? That, that is correct. Um, we're that far, at least. Yeah, yeah. We cannot um, uh, announce the artist list yet, but we will um, in not so long. I think in the beginning of, of July, we should be ready to do that. Um, we, we have a title, yeah, and the title sort of... Um, I derived out of, of uh, an ongoing research project, I could maybe say, that we've um, embarked on as artists, um, and that is sort of studying, you know, ideas around the domesticity, how we live, and here in the biennial, wanted to look more at how we live together, um, and therefore, uh, then the title, A Good Neighbor. Uh, I think we're going to get back to a little bit uh, about the role of being an artist and of being a curator. And I think actually both roles we see, as, see ourselves as some sort of researchers, uh, but we can talk more about, about that in a bit. Um, but maybe to present the title, uh, we can also show um, a couple of um, our slides. Uh, we were asked April last year if we would take on the roles as curators and we were very hesitant but we didn't have much time to make up our minds so um, actually only two weeks and then we decided to say yes because we probably never get uh, asked again to do a biennial <laughs> as artist. And we had done uh, three biennials as artists in Istanbul. We know the team there. We love the art scene there. So we were like, OK, you, we will get a lot of help doing that biennial. Um, then we came up with a title, uh, which was looking into what are the very uh, basic conditions for coexistence. How do we? come along living together in a reasonable manner in our communities and how have these conditions changed over the past years. And since we came up with the title, well, there was not only just a coup attempt in uh, Turkey and a lot of political consequences uh, as an aftermath, but there was also Brexit and there was Donald Trump and his idea of a wall to the Mexican border. So I would say the world turned into being rather bad neighbors in that year, um, which of course gave the title a different political twist. And that will be reflected in the biennial as well. As part of um, our working strategy, we started a, a billboard campaign where we have uh, place billboard around in the world in uh, different languages and um, asking uh, different questions about what could a good neighbor be. That partly to show that problems in one geographical location is not isolated from problems in other places in the world. So we wanted to have this kind of campaign in different parts of the world. Um, and um, yeah, so if any of you uh, know free billboard places in your city, <laughs> please let us know, we come and put it up. <laughs> we also uh, often, if it's wanted, of course, translate these questions uh, into the language spoken at the place where the billboards are shown. Um, as you see here, these are all questions. Also, even the title, A Good Neighbor, doesn't state who the get good neighbor is. Um, also, for the pre first press conference that we had in Istanbul in the beginning of December last year, we um, had 40 people from many different backgrounds, all uh, different kinds of ages, 
come one after the other on stage, also posing these 40 questions. We've chosen not to make a sort of longer uh, academic text or presentation uh, in the build-up to the biennial. Of course, we, as curators and also artists, rely very much on the um, academic community, but since we're not really academics ourselves, we thought we're better at, at asking questions. But maybe we can just watch a little clip that shows uh, a few of these um, performers that helped us present the first ideas at the press conference. İyi bir komşu, hemen taşınıp giden birisi midir? İyi bir komşu, komşu bir ülkeden midir? Is a good neighbor someone who has a close the borders stickers on their car? And here you also see the opening dates. That's to say the press preview will actually be on September the 12th. That's fantastic. Can we now engage, perhaps ask a very fundamental question? Why are biennials? I mean, they're expensive. Um, uh, can they be justified? Um, particularly as there is, I mean, who do they attract? Do they attract the art world that we're seeing here and in other biennials? Are they for the local population? Can you, all of you, expand a little bit on that? I, th I think a few, a, few, a few years ago, it was like a, a common rule that if you were um, uh, a critic uh, or a writer, you would uh, criticize uh, the big spectacular art event a lot. But a lot of people who would do that would be people who only went to these events and therefore they thought the world looked like that. I mean, you have the biannual events, but you have so much else going on. I remember being in a panel in London and I was speaking to one person uh, criticizing these big events uh, about whether he had been to South London to the artist one spaces recently because I was actually not so worried about these artist communities being threatened by the big biennials. I think it's something we love to ditch at a certain point in history where everything was much easier. And I think today we maybe learn to appreciate the possibility of coming together from different places in the world and feel a certain kind of solidarity and feel a certain kind of togetherness in a different way than maybe uh, we would perceive the biennial format like 10 years ago. Um, well, I, I come from, I, I, I live in Johannesburg, I come from South Africa, I, I come from a place that has a, a phantom pain of a Biennale that is no longer there. Um, some people in the audience might have experienced the Johannesburg Biennale, uh, especially, well, both the first and the second. Um, in my bio, it also says that I co-curated the CAPE uh, uh, 07, which is also, which also died, you know. So, yeah, well, perhaps I come from a place that cannot sustain this format, um, uh, f from a place whose complex political situations cannot also sustain um, such a large format. But, uh, you know, but other things are also possible. And, uh, and yesterday I was talking to a friend who, who does a school in, in their city where there is a Biennale in Dakar, actually. Um, and, and, uh, and, and, and I think for me, it's, um, you know, it's quite important, it's, it's interesting if, uh, to, to, to, to think of these events as not just once off, uh, but as processes, you know, like two-year processes that lead into the large-scale event. And, and it has been interesting for me to go to a place that does have a Biennale with, without the Biennale itself to, to see um, um, the place in context and, and therefore to, to be able to understand what a Biennale um, should or could 
be responding to in uh, in in in in in that in that place, um, because you know, yeah, sometimes there's a lot of organisations, a lot of conversations that are happening, and and I think an, an event like this, and at least for me, it is a, an opportunity to see um, ideas that have been on on um, perhaps let's say on a modest scale. Uh, building up and and ex experimenting with a, um, a larger format, um, but also still, you know, remaining modest within the larger format. I, I totally agree. I think the biennials have a great potential still. As you know, they've only been like really in the vogue for the last say 20, 25 years, uh, and there's still a growing number of them. And unfortunately, some biennials just copy the format of other by existing biennials and then it I tend to get a bit boring in the end uh, but of course it's you know already has this built-in structure that can change you know morph become something else we accepted that next time it's happening there's a completely different curator that can choose a completely different format but this needs to maybe to to to be explored um, deeper and I think it's amazing when I you know go to Sao Paulo by and like I went to see the one that Gabi was co-curating in Sao Paulo last year and see this meeting point between sort of your contribution to the biennial with these positions that I know very well from the Danish and the German curator and it worked just incredibly well and I don't think you would find these juxtapositions in any other place you know the private galleries and museums are not able to to do that and I'd also like to say, like, about the Istanbul Biennial, um, you know, it's, like, really one of the longest-standing art institutions in Turkey. It's the 30th anniversary this year. Um, so, you know, it's really something that the local art community rely on and also are always looking, looking forward to, uh, is my impression. So what makes a good Biennale? How do you say one's good? And, I mean, can you say one's good and one's not so good? No, there's so absolutely no rule. It also depends where it is. And, uh, uh, yeah, of course, what kind of person uh, is in, in charge of that biennial? Um, it depends on what point of time in history you make the biennial. What, what are the needs? What, what, what role do you fulfill? In Istanbul, uh, this time, I mean, the biennial has become more urgent than ever because there have been this political turbulence and a lot of uh, claims uh, for boycott, cultural boycott. So the people who are actually the progressive forces in Istanbul have been the ones who have suffered from it. And the less tourism, they're like for the young artists who cannot easily obtain a visa to Europe or have the financial uh, means to go and live somewhere else, there's a certain degree of isolation suddenly from like having uh, a situation where they were used to a lot of people coming, visiting. Almost no one is coming. And therefore, the biennial is playing such an important role in the in the local uh, art community, uh, both for the institutions, but most of all for the artists there. And that would have been a different situation just like some years ago. Well, last year, the I think it's called Chanakale Biennial was cancelled, wasn't it? It was immediately after the coup. Have you had encouragement pressure, ask people to st to maintain it or not to maintain it? What, what reactions have you had? They're, they're trying to do a, a new uh, edition of it. It had some local political uh, issues uh, linked to the cancellations as well, and we are collaborating with them. I mean, the situation in Turkey now is that people stick much more together than they did before, because you cannot really have all the small conflicts. You need to think a little bit bigger, so there is a lot of coming together and helping each other in, in, in different situations. We talked earlier when we talked to Venice, you said to me that actually everyone wanted you to maintain the, in, in, the in, Istanbul. In yes. Istanbul, absolutely, and therefore like um, um, the media um, 
writings that there have been uh, a little bit about uh, that how can you do uh, a biennial, how can you do cultural events in a country where like uh, the political climate is so turbulent and uh, um, you have a lot of people uh, who have lost their jobs or being imprisoned because of their views. Um, it's so spoken about from a position uh, where they don't realize the reality there. I mean, it's, it's mostly from people who are not there who doesn't have the feeling of what are the needs in Turkey at the moment, what do people... I mean, if you would, if you would cancel something like uh, the Art Biennial, who would you hurt? You would hurt all the people who are actually trying to do something progressive, whereas people who maybe have a more conservative view, they wouldn't care. I'd like to come on to the subject of curation. Um, in the case of Gabi, you're a curator. You have four co-curators, as we mentioned. Is that, I mean, that was your choice, obviously. Do you, does it in any way dilute your view? Dilute your view? Or as you said, um, you wouldn't feel that you were so alone. I mean, what were the reasons for having four co-curators or four curators? Um, there's there's many reasons, and I mean each person brings a different um, perspective. I don't. I mean it is my my choice, so I, obviously it's not to dilute, but to enhance um, um, the the positions that we we are looking for or we want to take. Um, and it's uh, yeah, it's really to yeah to have conversation partners. Um, who are also thinking from different uh, perspectives um, to bring these perspectives also into Berlin. And each one of them has a special relationship to Berlin as well. Now, you're a curator. Um, Michael Inga are artists. And in fact, there's recently been a number of biennials that have been curated by artists. So are you including your own work? No. <laughs> What are the differences? I mean, do you think there's a difference when an artist curates and a curator curates? Maybe you should ask the artists about that once we have yes, worked with Yes, but I am them. asking <laughs> artists. <laughs> no, it's hard to say. I think for us it was never, you know, we never saw like, the curatorial role as something completely other. Uh, you know, when we started doing art in Copenhagen in the 90s, there wasn't much you know, over markets. We were a completely new generation uh, coming out of the so-called Junge Wilde that had this sort of Danish, you know, branch as well that was very dominant. And all the museums were only interested in those 80s kind of guys. So if we didn't do it ourselves, you know, making the performance festivals, you know, in, the, in a park or any abandoned space or, you know, exhibitions and guarding them yourselves and all that and inviting your friends, nothing would really happen. So that's how very much how we started, and we collaborated with, you know, a, a bunch of, of, of friends, both in, in Malmo, over on the Swedish side, and also in Copenhagen, and then it became like sort of bigger international uh, connections as well. Um, and I think also us being a duo makes us have this conversation. You mentioned you don't want to have a conversation with yourself. <laughs> Sometimes I wish I had, but it's not going to happen in this lifetime. <laughs> you don't contradict yourself, so that's something. I, that's true. <laughs> um, no, so I think also that step doesn't feel so far. We're always in dialogue with each other, always in dialogue that the, with the people that help us realize our own projects as well so I feel it's very natural to have these dialogues with the artists I think one thing that we hear from the biennial team is that we're maybe not always that realistic <laughs> so maybe that's the <laughs> about things so that might be the artists that play as curators there are probably also some curators that get that 
that sure. they're not so no realistic. Reason. I mean, like curators are not, uh, their biennials are not alike. Like uh, they're not similar uh, to, to one curator's biennial is very different from another curator's biennial. And I'm sure our biennial will be quite different from other artists curated biennials as well. So um, at, at some point we, we, we gave ourselves some some, uh, freedoms where we had this uh, uh, press conference that only consisted of the 40 people's questions and we also do a book that has a bit of a different format from like normal uh, uh, biannual uh, catalogs as such so um, since we are not depending on being asked to do other biannuals we have a certain freedom <laughs> um. Your biennial is actually quite small, isn't it? How many artists are you? Have you? We um, have, as I know, like fifty-seven artists. Seven. Uh, yeah. And and in how many venues? We are having six venues, and they are being announced. And we, our biennial is sort of quite contained in a way within like walking distance of, of uh, each other, I mean, in terms of, of locations. Um, we're using um, two museums. I mean, it's good to have sort of the, you know, institutional structure for certain works as well. One is Istanbul Modern, and uh, the other museum is Pera Museum that also has a historical um, collection, uh, for instance, of Ottoman um, period painting and um, also, you know, um, um, maritime sort of uh, objects. Uh, that's been inspiring for some of the artists that are working in that museum. Then we have the Greek uh, school, Galata Greek School, that's also been used before, which has a great diversity of spaces, and everyone can have sort of their own uh, classroom, um, and that seems to work very well for a lot of artists as well. Then we have a modernist villa, and we have a hammam uh, this year that is really? not being so used get, anymore. You get a hammam, you get a steam bath at the same time. Well, <laughs> it's not really in use anymore. Uh, and then we're working with an artist collective um, uh, from Istanbul that are using their own studio. And you can walk from, from one place to another. And Gabby, I know that it's quite premature in a way to ask you, but can you tell us a bit more about the number of venues? Have you already sussed out where you want to... Um, I, I am in the process of sussing out where um, and to find a, a logical route uh, within Berlin, but also a, um, a conceptual route as well. Um, and as this is a conversation with the with to be partners, and nothing has been signed, I, I cannot say in public. But this is um, um, yeah, this is what I'm I'm, I'm busy with. The process. I'd be interested in all of your opinions. I mean, at the moment we have Documenta, which is in uh, I don't know how many locations, Castle, in Munster, um, Athens. I mean, that's very sprawling. Do you think multi-venues is, is a good thing because it brings the art to different places? Or do you, in your case, you can walk between it? Can you talk a little bit about that? I think, um, I mean, I worked on the Sao Paulo Biennale, which is interesting because it happens in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, the same venue um, every two years. So, and when you've seen other editions, you really have to um, think about those other editions, how they viewed space, and how to create a space that looks um, new, perhaps. Um, and... And, and that was great to kind of contain everything in, in one building, although it's a huge building. Um, and Oscar Niemeyer building. It's the it's Oscar fabulous. Niemeyer yeah. building. And in, in Berlin, of course, and, and everywhere else, the, the, the process is different. Um, but also it's interesting to look at the archives of, of, of, um, of the particular event to see which venues have been used before and, and for me, this has been really interesting to know what has happened to those spaces bef uh, now. Um, and, and, and also, and then it, it makes you think about the, the role that the Biennale has played in, in, in, um, in changing the, the, the cityscape. Um, and so for me, this is, this, is, this is quite interesting. 
and, um, and um, this is the 10th edition of the Berlin Biennale, so it is an anniversary edition. Um, so it, it's even more uh, interesting for me to, to, to see if it's possible to return at all to, to those <laughs> other venues. And of course, it's impossible because um, the city is changing There's, very yes, fast. Yes, and some yeah. of them are perhaps no longer available. So, yeah. so multiple venues, like, for example, Sharjah this year, you had to go, I think, out into the desert for some of the venues. I mean, is that, does that to an extent uh, we, we, we had We had a title that was uh, uh, A Good Neighbor. So we wanted to create a neighborhood feel so that you could walk in between the different venues, but they would be very uh, of very different character, each venue, but be symbolizing institutions for, for, for a neighborhood. Um, and then I think some curators do a fantastic job with these mega, mega, mega exhibitions, but um, I cannot imagine myself having a really uh, long conversation with 200 artists. I mean, we are two persons, we have 57 artists. We can sometimes uh, uh, split it up and we can have like, you know, hours of, on, of conversation in the studio. And I think that is part of the beauty of making a biennial that you actually don't um, take more food on your plate than you can digest somehow. Do you think that, that a biennial within a certain city, it's very interesting what Gabby said about Berlin, is that there's a history. Um, and it's, in your case, it's the Istanbul 15th, and for you it's the 10th. Should there be some sort of continuity between the biennials in, or, or the fact that it's different curators, you said earlier, that, that each curator makes a very different mark. Um, does the place where it's held have an influence? I think, I think you know, the continuity stays very much with the sort of mother organization in Istanbul, it's the IKSV, that also does the theater festival, the uh, music festivals and so on. Um, uh, and, and there is a continuity. The director is often staying for several uh, editions, and it's the same in, in Berlin. You know, uh, Gabi has been uh, um, the director for many years uh, of both Kunstwerke and, and, uh, and the Bayano. So I think the legacy is sort of like taken care of. Sometimes what I do miss a little bit, though, is that there is a proper archive of these different editions of the Biennials that could be more accessible to the audience. Um, I mean, now we have websites, so, you know, but sort of they, they are not maintained or it's hard to find them um, after a biennial uh, is, is over um, sometimes. You're doing a publication, though. You're d you, you have a publication that's going to mark and which will presumably keep that, those records, that history for the future. Partly, but it's always just a little part of like it never shows a whole process yeah. and, and, and yes. like the build up and the conversations around it. The public program doesn't have uh, such a big uh, part of the publication often and it's where a lot of uh, important things happen. But I think, yeah, it is important where a biennial is taking place and not at least it will perce be perceived very differently inside the audience heads. It will be a very different biennial, whether it's in Venice or in Berlin or in Istanbul, because the audience are different. They come for different reasons and they come for, with different backgrounds. Gabi, I think when you curated the uh, last year's Sao Paulo, uh, uh, co-curated, I'm sorry, um, I think that was when um, Dilma Rousseff was impeached at the same time where you were in the middle of political turbulence. We talked a little bit about Istanbul, but how did that affect the curation of that your, your curation of your Biennale? Uh, it, it, I mean, I, we, we had the, the title La, uh, Live Uncertainty in Sentisa Viva, um, you know, which we kind of established very early in our conversations. But 
of course, as uh, the the political scene was unfolding, it you know it became even more urgent. This um, thinking about yeah uncertainty in in, in the context of uh, of Brazil, and indeed when the Biennale opened in, during our press conference the day before. Um, um, at, or, or a few days before the impeachment was finalized, and uh, and the the man who calls himself the president of uh, Brazil now, um, Michel Temer, um, had a, a press statement proclaiming that the age of uncertainty is over, um, and so it was. You know, we were we were working and things were unfolding. You know, people were going to the streets, protesting, um, and and also, of course, and what what what we um, what we did is to is to is to really compose. At least we composed two letters to all the artists who were invited by that time, um, updating them on on the political situation as it was unfolding. Um, there are some artists who kind of, you know, shifted their positions, um, but also at the opening there were, you know, the the Foratema uh, slogan, uh, which uh, um, I think Tema means fear in in in in in, um, in Portuguese. Um, so people are proclaiming this kind of end of, of fear within the, the, the Biennale itself. So it became also a platform where um, this protest could potentially take place. But it, it uh, yeah, it seemed like, you know, it was always in conversation with uh, um, the unfolding or the political twists, as you, as you were saying. But it also really... Of course, you allow yourself to be twisted around so that you, you know, you, you, you can never be on, you know, on time all the time. But I think it's, a, I think it's the, as a platform that Biennale is in itself. It's it's still um, being read as a as a as, as as one that was really in conversation with the political scene as we speak as well as things unfold now. So you informed all of the artists as this as the situation was in, unfolding, and I mean, if God forbid, but some something happens, what will be? What do you feel your engagement should be in Istanbul? It will, in a way, we've already been through something similar, obviously, because some of the artists were invited in you know early summer or spring or early summer last year. So, of course, when the coup attempt happened and the after. I thought of, you know, of that happened um, a lot of the artists to different degrees because people are very different, you know, like you know, very, very interested in in uh, in understanding more about the local situation. And of course, we're not always the right one to answer. We could only, you know, recount our experiences and our impressions and would always put um, the artists or anyone who would be interested in contact with the... Um, with uh, uh, the team in Istanbul, like I mentioned, direct, the director, Big Öre, or the, the you know um, the great team that's in in, in place there. Um. So I'm going to open up to questions now. Um, so please put your hand up. I can already see one. And please, could you wait for the microphone? Thank you so much. Hi. I remember 20 years ago or so, biennales were important art shows, but they were viewed by artists as art shows. They often brought pre-made work to the shows. Now, of course, that's completely changed. And I wanted to ask all three of you, really, what the role is going to be of work that's made in situ or indeed work that's made specially for your biennales. Is this a very important element? It seems to be the trend over the last few years. So I wanted to ask what kind of proportion, roughly, will be work that's made specifically either in situ or made and conceived precisely for those biennales? Well, we have uh, the around uh, 57 artists. We have 30 new commissions, so we have a, a big part of uh, new com new decommissioned works that are like site-related in one way or the other. But we also have uh, historic positions uh, um, from um, artists who are not even 
alive uh, uh, today to contextualize uh, uh, working methods um, of the contemporary artists that we uh, work with in the biennial. So I would say it also comes down to, to the economy. How much can you actually afford to commission? I would love to have commissioned just new works and it would be a new experience for everyone, but um, that's absolutely not possible. And it's nice to play some works that have maybe not been um, in the public gaze, like uh, uh, recently. Um, I don't like to go to a biennial and just see uh, hits and highlights from the past 10 years. I find that quite boring as an audience. Um. It's get, I have to find a, a way to speak without <laughs> saying much. <laughs> um, but, uh, but I agree with um, everything you've said. But I mean, for me, I think there's another aspect that is interesting for me. Um, uh, and some of the artists that I've started having conversations with and, and, and you know, I have to respond to, to their concerns, of course. Um, but um, but but what we've started to do is, for example, find residences uh, for artists, you know, who are working in one city, um, and creating these possibilities where they can go somewhere else, um, you know, you know, where it could be interesting for them uh, and the work that they are doing, and for those works to be created from not from you know, their usual um, city or studio. And, and for me, I'm, you know, I'm really interested in, in, so I'm in conversations with a lot of people, moving people around, um, but also, yeah, creating possibilities for, for artists that did not have them before. And, and there might be po possibilities for showing um, a, an existing work that hasn't been seen in a certain context, and it doesn't have to be historical in, in that sense, but already existing. But there's uh, also uh, a, a position where, you know, um, I've spoke. I spoke to an artist maybe five years ago, and they had a dream to do something, and then I want to bring that dream into into this context. So, you know, I you know I don't want to be counting numbers of. Uh, what is made for the Biennale or what is not, but I'm interested in, in, in, yeah, in creating different uh, possibilities for production or for, for representing uh, an existing work. I think we have also discovered that it's been interesting to bring up like historical, some historical positions or existing work in the light of the political climate. Say, for instance, there's been a call for women from like well, the authorities to take on more traditional roles, get more children, spend more time at home and so on. So we've actually also chosen to show some feminist positions both from, you know, from the 60s, 70s and the 90s that sort of also can sort of shed some light on the current situation while being combined with, you know, current feminist positions. Eh? So next question, I can see another hand at the front here. No, it's not working. Okay. Um, I have a question to Engren and Dragset. Your um, artistic practice is working already normally with many other artists, friends, and I wonder if your Biennale is not also your artwork. We, we really try uh, not to make it our artwork. Uh, also because that would be, give us far too little surprise and be far too predictable. 
and it would be a little bit boring maybe uh, for ourselves. For us, we see it as a fantastic chance to um, work with artists who have complete different working methods than ourselves and different universes and dig into that and get inspiration from that and understanding of that and put things together. But of course, there are elements that are reflecting us because I mean like it's not that we can completely change personalities now we are curators and then we drink coffee in a complete different way and sit on the chair in a different way of course we are us but uh, I mean there will be a lot of installation for sure because we love people getting uh, spatial experiences uh, but we don't try to make a biennial that is like um, reflecting our own universe as artists. I mean, that, that would be too reduced, I think. Next question. Um, I agree that sometimes, and especially these past times, all the biennials have been, uh, some of them, like the reproduction, same format, same situations. And sometimes the title's too big for the exhibitions in itself. Let's take an example with certain freedom. Arte viva arte. Art is for the artist and for everyone. So we expect a lot because it's a kind of or organic title. But it wasn't. It became, in my own opinion, like another Viennale, like the same. Uh, so my question is for especially the lady who is, has two years ahead for La Viennale de Berlin. There is also an element of uh, everyone look for the magical environments, magical spaces, those that had history, and those that produce a certain um, emotion, additionally, are architectural involved. And uh, why not to, get in the public and the art in those spaces that doesn't have any history with arts, you know, to break somehow the rules and to make other citizens that are not involved with art to make an interaction with, with those that are uh, part of the Biennale or the public. So my yes. question is... Yes, what is the um, question? Uh, Thank uh, you. Uh, knowing that you cannot uh, speak too much, but are you already thinking in breaking some rules in uh, transform or give okay. a travesty history yeah. somehow to the same type of situation. Okay, so Gabi, I think this question was particularly directed at Gabi, did I understand? Yeah, yes, yes, because it's, it's, it's in process yet, so are you seduced by some strong uh, yes. transformation? So I think Gabi will answer the question. Um, I, I had a, a slide that I wasn't sure if I will show, so perhaps um, this could be a time can to... We show the f can we show the slide? It's on its way. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's coming, it's coming. Um, the Biennale is opening in a year, not two years, so I don't, I don't have two years, but... but <laughs> um, there we are, Gabby. So, yeah, I, I also... I wasn't sure if I wanted to share um, this with you, but it, this is this is a, also what I'm talking about when you know when I'm talking about many things. Uh, Berlin has um, um, uh, has a lot of history. It's overflowing. You know, there's many big projects that are happening. There's um, projects happening in smaller spaces. There's questions that are really p uh, important now. Um, for Europe, but let's speak about Berlin, and and uh, and this idea, like of one wanting to find really a position, is like it can be really dazzling as uh, uh, and and and so really to to think about this uh, idea of a dazzling camouflage is um, is uh, is not to to be opaque in a way that, you know, to, to withdraw information. There's many things that I cannot talk about, but really to, um, to be able to, to, yeah, to go to the unexpected, um, and maybe not, not with spaces, but more, you know, with questions. In, and, and right now we're sitting in a panel that is titled, uh, 
Personal, personal and post-colonial. And, and, post and, and, and, yes. and post-colonial. And, and I think both of us don't know where this, you know, comes from. Mm -hmm. um, but somebody, you know, thought about um, post-colonial. Um, I don't know where that came from. And, uh, and, and, and, and for me, it's really been quite interesting having conversations with people in, uh, in, in Berlin who, who, who think they already know where I'm going, you know? And, and, and, uh, and these conversations are really, really useful, you know, because they, they, they're useful. But at the same time, there's so many things, you know, that are questions of my being um, that are interesting and happening in, in Berlin. So like this idea of, of, of really trying to find a position that, um, you know, not necessarily to stand out against the rest, but like to, to be able to say, okay, here's a position, here's a, uh, a large scale exhibition, not that we, we want to, you know, to make it even bigger, but, you know, to, to, to be able to, to, to be able to dodge certain bullets, you know, because these bullets exist. And, and, and, and, and so when you kind of see this, it should, it's more interesting if it's moving as a GIF. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's hard, not, not because it's not educational, not because it's, it's not giving you information, but more because it's, it, it's complex. You know, it's complex. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't also want to go to certain historical places. Um, and as I said before, I would be interested to revisit some venues of, of, of, uh, that have been used before, of course, knowing that it's impossible, but somehow they become possible in a different way. Um, and, uh, you know, and at the same time, sometimes I do like art spaces as well. So oh, I'm sorry, I think we could continue a lot longer, but there is another talk after ours. So I want to thank very much our panelists for talking to us about Biennales. Thank you.